More than a few episodes have functioned as obituaries and remembrances of people who've been a huge influence on my life and outlook. I thought for a change, I'd do a testimony of somebody who's still around. And his name is Patrick O'Malley. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Peter Healy, Daniel Boyd, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. When I was working at Focus Studios, and it was starting to become the sunset period of that startup, I decided I needed to go out and get a job, and not only get a job, but get one that would make up for the enormous debts that I was building up at the time. Much of this money had been given to me in a friendly manner to help me work on the various businesses I had, but it translated out to about $12,000 from family and friends who had believed in things that I was trying to do. Therefore, I knew that my next job was going to have to be a little more mercenary and a little bit less fun. The way that I did it was I went on to Usenet, to a Usenet news group called NE.jobs, Northeast Jobs, looked for Unix and dollar sign, knowing that I kind of understood Unix, and I found an ad for a company a few towns over that, at the very least, would help me pay off my debts. When I called, the man who picked up was Patrick O'Malley, and his first question was, can you come down right now? I couldn't, but I was able to come down the next day. I got a lift to do the interview, where I first met Pat and one of the managers of this company. The company's name was not that interesting. It was called Thompson Technical Services Group. It did some sort of hosting, and they were moving from VAXs into Unix and needed somebody they could work with. I didn't know what I was walking into, and I was very worried about coming off wrong or unprofessional and also not having all of the knowledge that I would need to be able to get such a well-paying job. Pat O'Malley was and is a balding gentleman usually wearing a business suit with a very intense voice. If you need to visualize him, think of Peter Weller as Murphy in RoboCop with the same sort of facial shape and intense eyes. And Pat talked to me about what kind of person they were looking for and also gave me an assignment. The assignment was about optimizing for RAID, redundant array of inexpensive disks, which he believed very much had subtleties that could be improved. He gave me a few questions about how I would improve a situation and then sent me on my way and asked me to come back in about a week with my answers. I worked really hard on those answers, trying to research RAID, figuring out what it could possibly be optimized for, and the next week came in with my answers. It turned out that my answers were wrong, and Pat hired me. He explained to me that it was less about the fact that I was wrong than I had been willing to put in the time to focus on this job, even though I wasn't being paid to do so, and it was clear that I took it seriously and would spend the time to get things right after consulting with others. He then explained to me the unique way in which he would hire people. He would not hire people permanently. Instead, he would hire them as a consultant for 30 days, four weeks of work, at a very, very high rate. He said to me, you're going to make buckets of cash here, more than you could ever imagine. And after 30 days, if it looks like it works out, we'll hire you. His thinking behind this was that it was easier to pay people a lot of money in a month, see how they worked, and then decide whether or not to have them join the company than it would be to hire someone and spend years trying to get rid of them. The pay was hourly, and they had enough of a backlog that within that month I had paid off every single debt I had owed any friend or family member going back 
essentially to the beginning of my life, maybe with the exception of my dad. During this time, and in the years afterwards that I worked with him, I found out a lot about Pat. He had worked for Digital Equipment Corporation, and he had been an educator, a trainer. His favorite work was being in front of a classroom of people who were attentive and smart and helping guide them to the next level of knowledge. He adored being able to go deep into subjects, being questioned, answering as best as he could, and coming to conclusions with the class. When Digital Equipment Corporation had moved away from wanting educators and having the sort of training they used to have, Pat had moved over to this company. The company itself had a weird lineage. It had been, believe it or not, the beginning of a huge investment by AT&T to start an online service that would have easily competed with America Online. But after about two years, they had decided they didn't want to go forward with the project, and it was purchased instead by the Thomson Corporation, who turned it into a hosting company and were moving away from having vaxes. I was meant to be the vanguard of Unix people, just the first of a bunch of weird, learn-by-the-seat-of-our-pants, cobble-things-together sort of folks that the company hired. Just to spoil my branch, I worked for this company for the next 14 years, with one year away with another company before returning. These 14 years were punctuated by different owners, different focus, and in a few cases, different office buildings. But it was primarily my main income until I became a full-time historian and archivist. Getting back to those 90s, though, I spent a lot of time learning as I went, hearing about a subject brought up by a customer, frantically researching it online, coming back with an answer the next day. Sometimes I'd come up with a solution, we'd all have a discussion about it, and that solution would fly or drop, depending on how everyone felt about it. Pat ran these meetings, and these meetings were my master class in how to conduct groups of people for better and for worse. Pat was fiercely protective of his group. Many times he said to me and the others, if I am ever asked by the company to fire one of you, I will tell them I'm the one who's fired and I'll quit. Nobody tells me what to do with my people. Our well-being was critical to him. When he figured out that I would stay after work, he would always check to make sure I was doing it because I thought I'd like to and never because I thought I had to. Whenever we gave him time estimates, he would double them, saying, you are doing your best to give a good number, but let's give you appropriate slack before you do it. Pat's humor was sardonic, bordering on vicious. Whether that led to tough skin or hurt feelings, I felt I could keep up with him, and I always felt at the bottom of it was always a foundation of respect for whoever he was dealing with. He was a master of nicknames and a prince of skepticism. I would sometimes be in the room for upper management meetings where he would lock his face into a position of listening. And then when a question came out, you would realize that he was waiting for his moment to bring to ground all of the lofty ideas that weren't based in reality. To Pat, education was critical, but even more critical was time. So much of what he would tell me would be based around time. He would tell me how being in my 20s gave me certain advantages because I could do something that would take 10 years and still be able to enjoy it at the end. He was very much a disciple of compound interest and gained experience along with never, ever selling yourself short or letting others do it for you. In the realm of my three years under Patrick, I did all sorts of experiments with web and archiving. Textfiles.com was started while I worked for him, along with the BBS list that would lead to the BBS documentary and all of the rest of my documentaries. Even when he didn't understand my interest in something, he understood that I was interested, and he encouraged me, and he always encouraged me to put my own curiosity 
and interests ahead of some sort of nebulous goal for the firm. When Pat left the company, he went to work for a very interesting dot-com startup that was one of thousands of little companies all trying to make their mark in an internet-connected world. A couple times, he hired me once again as a consultant. I would explain to him that I was already employed, but my fierce loyalty to him that he had earned would fill my weekends up on a tower working on a small and weird computer room to upgrade the machines for his firm. The turnover, the change to ownership at the company I was working at, meant that when Pat started to look around for a place for his company to host, he decided to come back and ask if we were the company that were right for him. He'd come back and have a meeting with our salespeople. <laughs> he demanded that I be in the sales meeting, and the entire time for a sales visit, he spent complimenting me. Turning to the salespeople and saying, well, any company that's got Jason is the kind of company we want to have our product at. You guys are so lucky to have a person like Jason. The whole time, I watched the glint in his eyes, and I realized that that look had been there all the times we were together. That bit of shiny amusement, sparkling when he was messing around with people, taking life with both hands, and if not always having work friendships, certainly having camaraderie so that we all knew every day may change, but we have at least this work today. When I stir around in what makes me what I am, I see so many ingredients from this guy. My skepticism, my intensity, my fierce loyalties. I've tried to be with Archive Team, that set face in the corner that watches everybody come up with ideas and then produce one piercing comment before everybody scatters under the sound and intensity of it. Realizing that we are only guaranteed today, and maybe not even that, and we should take the most of what we're given, appreciate it, and bring everyone around us entertainment, joy, and appreciation. Like many work relationships, I've only seen Pat a few times in the years since I got out of that industry. Pat has never been to the Internet Archive. I'm not sure how much of what I do here he's aware of. But I do know this, that when I have seen him for these short evenings, get-togethers, lunches, and brunches, Pat has never changed at his core. He smiles, he laughs, he stands at the edge of one really good jab and always gives off the feeling, the feeling I try to give to others, that if he's ever asked for somebody to go, he goes first. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to James Bikoyanu, Mark Pilgrim, Corey Thomas, Emilio Oliveira, Matt Reynolds, Ernie Hershey, and Michael Rubin, along with the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. For years and years and years, Pat has been a hustler. I've always seen him looking for the next opportunity, reaching out to people, having a good time doing it. I'm proud to call myself one of his students. And I ask you, do you have someone like that in your life that maybe you haven't thought about for a very long time? Maybe it might be a good time to reach out and thank them so that your testimony isn't an obituary. <laughs>